I never got into skateboarding to be number one. Like that was such a jock mentality and that's what I was trying to rail against. Through my experience as an entrepreneur doing these other projects, suddenly I found myself with other opportunities just through connections. Everybody wanted you to land it. But I really didn't think that I'd be able to do it. I'd been trying it for years, you know. I mostly just did it to, <laughs> for the crowd. Certain industries, we can say sports, there is a player or somebody who, who comes in that's got a love of the game that completely, completely revolutionizes that game. One is Tiger Woods. There used to be a time nobody looked at golf and then a Middle Eastern guy like me, we don't golf in Iran. We start watching golf because of Tiger Woods. And this man sitting next to me, Tony Hawk, they used to be guys skateboarding until this guy shows up and next thing you know, it becomes a big game. And now millions on top of millions of people worldwide follow the sport because this revolutionary man brought so much attention to Tony Hawk. Oh, well, thank Father, you. Thank you so much. So some of your stats that I look at, I think 103 competitions you were in, 73 you won, 18 you were second place, 12 years in a row you were a champion in this world. I mean, you got the video game. Mario is bragging about the fact <laughs> that he can crack the code in the video game and there's no gravity. $1.4 billion of sales with your video game. Before we get into all the stuff that you're doing right now, you're venture capitalist, an entrepreneur, all these other things, how did this whole thing get started initially when you all of a sudden started skating? I was just skating because my older brother's into it and uh, a few of my friends in my neighborhood were doing it and eventually I found my way to the skate park and I think that was my moment of realization when I saw, I literally saw people flying out of swimming pools and it was like, I want to do that, because I was a bit of a daredevil as a kid, and I was like, whatever it takes to do that, that's what I'm going to do. And, and eventually, I quit all the other team sports I was playing in and, and just focused on skating. And I, luckily, I was young enough that it wasn't that I, like I was choosing a career, because there was no career to be chosen at the time. You couldn't really make a living at it. But I was young enough that I could do it as a hobby and get away with it. Was anybody at that time making money doing this? No, I mean, a very few, like there were a few pro skaters. Um, they were competing for a hundred dollar first place. Really? Yeah, it wasn't, it just wasn't, it was very, skateboarding exploded as a sort of novelty in the 70s, but it, it was very difficult to make a living at it. And there was not sustainable in terms of the growth of it and, and the popularity. And so for a kid like me, I just wanted to, learn new tricks, that was it. Like my motivation was never to make a living at it. In fact, the, the reality was once you got out of high school, you reached an age of responsibility, you had to quit skating. You had to quit skating. Well, you just- You're you, not gonna make money, $100. Gonna, yeah, like yeah. You, you could do it as a hobby once in a while, but no one was, you know, that was never the career path. So you have a video coming up. By the way, he's got a very, he just showed me some clips here on what he's doing. You're about to turn 50, by the way, which happy <laughs> yes. early birthday to you. Thank you. And, and, and uh, you'll hear what he did at 48, which is sick what he's doing at 48. He's got this video coming out with 50 tricks he did here. And then there's an interesting fall. You just have to see it. It's going to come out in <laughs> next few weeks. Uh, May 12th, my birthday. May 12th, okay, very cool. I read somewhere that you got into skating at nine years old, meaning your brother gave you the first skateboard yep. at nine years old. From nine years old, seven years later, you go pro at 14, I think. Yeah. And then at 16, you were considered the number one skateboarder in the world at 16 years old. Yeah, I, it's, I, it sounds lofty, but it, it, the skating scene was so small. Do you know what I mean? It was, and, and for me, it was a big deal, obviously. But uh, like, for instance, to turn pro, I had reached the top of the amateur ranks. There, you know, there wasn't a lot of competition. I reached the top of the amateur ranks and then I went to enter the next competition and a lot of my peers were turning pro and, and so the, my sponsor just said, well, what do you wanna do? And so I'm filling out, literally filling out the entry form to the competition and instead of the amateur box, I checked the pro box. Purely accidental. No, 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 I'm just saying like, that's all it was. It wasn't, it. There was no celebration, Got there was it. no contract. Got it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was just more like, okay, now I'm moving up a stage in competition. And so it wasn't, it just didn't feel like such a monumental thing. And then I'd go back to school the next week and I was a ghost. You know, skateboarding was far from popular. It was like the, the a most uncool thing you could do. So all of those elements kept me in check in terms of, you know, I, I sure I'm the number, like I eventually reached the top of the ranks of the pro. I was the number one pro, but I was still this unknown dude in high school. Now, I, I, I also read that at 18 years old, you started, you started getting some sponsorships. You started making some money. Where yeah, you were making I started little... making really decent money at age 17. Okay, got it. 
Because it was something about you were making more money than your teachers. Yeah. The moment you graduated, you bought a house. I bought a house while I was a senior in high school. Well, you bought a house yeah. while I was a senior in high school. Yeah. How was that? That's a pretty big deal. That's, I mean, not uh, a lot of kids get to see that. Especially at that time. Today, yeah. a lot of times nowadays, you know, people make money internet, but at that time, there is no drop shipping or Amazon. You're making this with no internet. Yeah, well, I, everything that I was making mostly was on um, royalties of signature items. So my skateboards, that was my main source of income and prize money. And my dad was in the Navy and I, I mean, he was retired, but you know, he had a very good sense of, of finances and stability and, and he thought like, this is not gonna last. You know, he immediately realized that, like, this is probably short term, you should put your money away. And he's the one who encouraged me to buy a house. And he was, he was the first one to really be astute in that way in my life, where, because all my friends, you know, we're making six figures at a time when we had no appreciation for the value of money or how long it will last. And, you know, we're buying everything, like dropping thousands of dollars a sharper image. <laughs> <laughs> so is it fair to say like at that time while you're doing this the party side the fun side you're just having a blast going through this process uh, or were you yeah, a pretty disciplined I, I never guy? lost sight of the skating though okay so for sure there were a lot of new elements and distractions yeah. that, that came into place and and you know we suddenly we were not just we were beyond being uncool suddenly we were sort of in the limelight and girls were finally paying attention yep. to us and things like that. So for sure, all those things came into play. Um, and, you know, owning a house at 17, your house is always the party house. Your parents are always gone. So that was also an element, but, but I never lost sight of the fact that skating got me there and people are relying on me to continue skating or, or expecting me to keep improving. And, and that's all I ever wanted to do. And, and I did see a lot of my friends get too distracted and lose focus and you know kind of lose their career because of it. Tony, were there guys that were just as good as you at the time, maybe even a little bit better who got uh, lost focus and, and completely went a different direction? I think so. I think, I think there were definitely some people who had potential that you know that lost sight of it and, and skating no longer was the priority. The priority was the party. Um, but that happens in all walks of life, yeah. you know, not just skating. We, we have, a, have a nephew who is obsessed with soccer. Everything to him is like he sleeps with his ball at uh -huh. six, seven years old. The guy's amazing. We were at a game last week, Galaxy, we're on the field with Zlatan, and he's just, he loves soccer. Were you that nine-year-old kid that slept with you? Like, were you in love? Like, were you fully in love with this game of skateboarding? Uh, yeah, well, by the time I was... By the time I was 10 years old, I knew that's all I wanted to do, and I quit. I, I quit Little League the year that my, my dad was appointed president of Little League. <laughs> what a way to say that. It was a weird, it was, a, it was an awkward the... conversation, yeah. <laughs> How do you have that conversation at 10 years old? That's what's really... Uh... Well, he knew because he, he would actually have to forcibly pull me from the park to go to practice. And at some point that happened so many times, it was like, Dad, I don't, I don't want to go play baseball. You were dreading it. You just love this. Yeah, I want to stay here and skate. And, and I, I did tell him, I think, I, I think the, the way that he accepted that was when I told him, I go, Dad, every time I go to the skate park, I get better. Like, I'm, I always learn something new or I learn a better technique and I improve. And when I go play baseball, I don't feel like that. It's good for him as a military guy, because, you know, military sometimes it's a little bit, you know, uh, strong as a former Navy guy to communicate and be able to say go ahead and do it you know it's yeah well also I was the youngest of four kids um, and my my siblings had already moved out by then so he just wanted anything to keep me busy <laughs> got it got it so and by the way this is the, the, I'm assuming this is a very small tight community because when we came in here today Sean White is doing a bunch of stuff here and he's just you know walking around as if it's not a big deal and <laughs> yeah. you know you read stats that the moment he won the gold medal it was the second most viewed event in the history of uh, Olympics, including summer, and he was the 100 gold medal for the U.S., which is a big deal. And it's just, you know, skateboarding here, rip socks, just relaxing, <laughs> yeah. chill. Is that like uh, a, is that well, like my a... Ramp is my ramp is one of the best, for sure. You know, you get what you pay for, and um, a, lot of the, a lot of the top ramp skaters, this is their go-to place to practice. What makes a ramp great? Well, really how smooth it is and, and how sturdy it is, and, and that seems simple. But we were building ramps out of wood scraps for so long just to make a structure that kind of resembled a pool 
that nothing was true, nothing was perfect, you know, everything had a lot of flaws in it. And when I set out to have this, this ramp built, this ramp was supposed to tour arenas. Who, like, who made it? Is there a guy uh, that makes it that specialized? This, this was kind of an experiment. The, the, before the people made this one, there was no true permanent ramp setup. I mean, there was no true um, portable ramp setup because all of the ramps were, they're so clunky and, and the best ramps took a whole day to get up. They were good, but they just weren't efficient. And uh, when we set out to build this one, I, I put it to a staging company that does um, concert venue stuff for like ACDC and Kiss and you know Britney Spears at the time. And, and they, they put up big stage productions that go up and down fast. And so I said, well, this is the dimensions. This is the design. You guys figure it out. So uh, let me ask you, uh, as far as something like this goes, if I wanted to build something like this, what would it run me? This ramp right here was about 600,000. 600,000 to build something like this. Mm -hmm. And for somebody like you, Tony, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm just assuming, and correct me if it's wrong, for somebody to be a 12-time champion and you've done all these radical types of stunts in your career, do you feel the slightest edge that's off if you go on a different ramp, you feel it instantly? Is yeah. it something, you, you know, yeah, I don't like this part. This well, is a, it's not that you don't like it, you just have to adapt to it. Got it. Every ramp's different for the most part. I mean, they've gotten more, they've gotten more of a standard, especially with X Games, you know, and, and other events. Like there's, a, there's basically a radius that works best and there's a you know, amount of flat and everything. And, and if it's built well, it'll feel very similar to this. The only thing that varies is the surface. But there's still, you know, there's still backyard ramps. There's still ramps that are totally different sizes. I used to be much more able to adapt to those things because I skated pools and all the pools were very <laughs> different and rough. And now because I skate this, the irony of skating something like this so, that it's so perfect, it, it messes you up for everything else. Got it. So, so you tough to go back to a pool. Or anything, use? you know, or any, like pretty much any other ramp is, for me, I have a, a, I, I have a bit of a hard time warming up, let's put it that way. Elsewhere. Yeah, but I used to be much more diverse because I had to skate the worst stuff. So that was an edge. I mean, if you're coming... <laughs> it was an edge, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. it was an advantage, yeah, which is, which is a weird thing to say. So let me ask you, there was a period in your world where uh, almost like, you know, how baseball goes through a strike, you know, something's gone. You guys also had a strike at one, not necessarily a strike, but there was like a flat time, right? Where some guys weren't making money. Yeah. You, I think you even at one point, you said you couldn't even afford to go have $5, what was it? You had a $5 oh, yeah, Taco yeah. Bell, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of your peers that didn't make the right decisions, they left because it was challenging times, and then it seemed like all of a sudden it came back up. Was there a single event that spiked it back up or became so um, relevant? Yeah, I wouldn't say that it was very sudden, but uh, definitely the early 90s, the, the wave of 80s skate popularity was dying off, mostly because there were no facilities. All the skate parks were shutting down because they couldn't afford liability insurance, um, and so there just weren't that many places to go. The, you know, the, the the general attitude towards skating was that it was already sort of rebellious and outcast and you know maybe not a positive influence for kids so they, there were a lot of things working against it so in the in the early 90s everything kind of went underground and that's when street skating really came into play because there was nowhere to go so people took to the streets and and the urban landscape became the skate park and that's how people learned how to skate ledges and rails and jumping down stairs and and all that and then uh there was sort of this revolution of technique and, um, and tricks that was happening. And so when uh, the first X Games came around <clears throat> in 1995, skating had sort of been through this, this transition. And then there was a whole new type of skating happening and kids flocked to it. They loved it, you know? They loved the irreverent attitudes. They loved the risk factor. They loved the excitement. And I think that was the turning point for sure was like was X Games. Wasn't there a time like almost like X Games stopped because they didn't know if it was going to continue similar to UFC? I don't know. I don't know how I don't know the internal conversations. I know that through the first three or four years it was it was gaining traction. And then sort of in the late like late 90s, early 2000s is when they really hit their stride. And then they started doing multiple events mm. and then they were doing like X trials and, and international X games. And then they kind of went, I think they, they kind of spread themselves too thin after that. I, Cause I remember, I mean, I, I'd watch X games. I'm like, you know what? I don't know if this thing's going to be around or not. And then you'd see it again and again and again. And yeah. then boom, comes the event. What is it? June 20. There was a time where they did, they did four in one year. And then that 
got to be like, okay. <laughs> a little too much. Yeah. How many is it right now? Later on, though. That was later on. Now it's, now it's two a year, I think, oh, winter, so and, a, winter and summer, yeah. Got it. So, so let's talk about June 27th, 1999. Everybody, I can't, I don't know about everybody around the world, myself, I'm not even a skater. I <laughs> remember that day when you were doing your deal and then all of a sudden you landed and it was like, you know, everybody wanted you to land this. Walk us through the first time, you know, that 900 was done on live television. Um, wow. Well, the, I, I think th I'd have to go back to sort of the quest for the 900. I learned 720s, which is a double spin <clears throat> in uh, 1985. And it was always in, you know, in my head, like, well, the next obvious rotation is a 900. And I didn't actually get the, the <laughs> guts to try it in, until about 85, probably almost 10 years later is when I really started to spin it and, and realized that I could gain enough speed and get the spin fast enough to get around. And I tried for years. I tried to do it. I, I would like set certain days and have people shoot video of it. Um, you know, and, like get a photographer, Today's the day I'm gonna do it, let's take photos. And then I would like, the closest I ever got, I came down the wall and then I ran to the flat bottom and broke my rib. My quest for it was, you know, almost a 10 years in at that point. So wait a minute, before June 27, 99, you've never landed it? I never landed. Oh, so you've never landed it off camera? No, no, no. So the first time you ever landed yeah. it was that? Yeah. Wow, that makes it even more special. My first real attempt at it was 1989 and I ended up on my back on the flat bottom and thought, Maybe I should wait on this. 89, is that the same time as a, a guy named Danny? There was a story about a guy that- Danny Way. Danny, yeah, that, yeah. that he, he apparently did, but he didn't, he- He was the first one to really show it was possible, for sure. He was the first one that showed yeah. it was possible. Yeah, because he, he got all the way around in the air, he did the spin and he actually landed back on the wall. And that, I mean, that is a monumental moment to me in skateboarding because it was like, oh, Danny shows that it is possible and for sure like I took the, I took inspiration from that and was Danny part of your community was Danny like a guy that you yeah, guys were he was, local he's one of the most innovative skaters to date I mean for sure he's the guy that started the whole mega ramp movement you know those big big ramps that they have the X yeah. Games he's the guy that that was the first to really make that happen so Tony you landed <laughs> it would walk Sorry. me through like when you landed this 900 um so well okay so so fast forward to that night um they were having a best trick event and they had held best trick events um, in the past at different events and it usually just ends up people trying their hardest stuff and mostly people falling all the time. And I had a little more strategy where I was like, I know that I have done these couple of tricks, so at least I, I'm gonna get those in the, you know, get those in the bank at, and then I'll have a trick to go off of, like for, for whatever they're judging. And I did, I did two of them and I got them pretty early and then I tried my, what was gonna be my harder trick, which was a varial 720, which is like a 720, and turning the board an extra half turn. That was gonna be my big trick. And I landed that one early on. So I still had time left. And for me, the next trick in my sort of wish list is a 900. But I really didn't think that I'd be able to do it. I've been trying it for years, you know, so I mostly just did it to to, <laughs> for the crowd. Did anybody say, Tony, let's try the 900? Was no, it a new I, decision? No, uh, the announcer, I think, said something like, what about a 900, you know? And I was like, all right, I'll do it for the crowd, it, you know, just to show them, like, this is what I would love to do. And I started, I tried a couple, and something clicked in those first few where I was spotting my landing every time, and that rarely happened. Usually it was like, one spin was really good, and one just was flailing. Um, and eventually I would, I would get hurt. That's how it would always go. So this night, it was like every spin was pretty consistent. So I started putting it on the wall. And the first couple times I put it on the wall, I fell forward the way that I did when I broke my rib, but not as bad. And then I realized that in the middle of the spin, if I shift my weight to my back foot, I'll remedy that fall forward. And it started working. I basically, at that moment, like <clears throat> the time for the event had run out. And I knew that I was either going to make it or get taken away in an ambulance. And you, you made that distinction, that decision uh, right there? It wasn't even like a conscious thought. I just, I just knew that I was gonna see it through or get taken out doing it. You, you, you hit it your fourth time? Or was it the fourth time or the fifth time when you hit it? Uh, no, I think it was, it was further, it was, it was closer to like 12 tries or so, which, which is standard. I mean, even, even now, like if I set out to do it, you know, and I've done it a few times since then, um, it, it takes me a good at least eight or nine tries to get start getting it again.
You tweeted uh, when you turned 48, you said, I just landed a 900. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one, um, like I said, every once in a while I get the bug and I'll start spinning yeah. it again. And I had started doing that. I actually started, tried it at an event not long before that and thought, oh, maybe I could do it again. And then I waited until the anniversary date, June 27th. So I waited uh, until that day and set out to do it here on this ramp. Here? Here, yeah. Got it. And that was 2016, right? I think it was like a 17-year yes. anniversary when you hit that? Mathematically, you know, what is, what is the bigger <laughs> mathematical, you know, complexity of hitting a 900? What makes it so complicated to hit a 900? Um, it's, not, it's more physics than math. It's more uh, when you spin <clears throat> two and a half times, you are blind to your landing zone twice. And that is, is the most... Um, <clears throat> that's the most disorienting thing. The like, fact that you have two blind spots. Yeah, twice blind to the ramp is so disorienting that by the time you come around, you really don't know where you are. And at some point, if you've been practicing enough, you just start to understand where you're gonna be by the speed of your spin and by the height you got. And that's what I've gotten to at this point in my life where I know the exact amount of speed I need and the exact amount of torque I need to start spinning. Yeah. And if that doesn't happen, even though I'm spinning and I'm blind, I know kind of how I'm going to fall. And that, that is something that you only learn through the worst experiences. <laughs> Wasn't there a, a, a 12 year, I think only four people have hit the 900 since that time? Was uh, it more than four? No, I four? think it's more now. I mean, now uh, there, are, there are young kids that grow up and they skate ramps and at, you know, before age 10 they've done it. So I'd say it's closer to probably maybe 15 that I've hit the yeah plan. so even yeah. Though, you know it's Rod not it's it's funny because it's not it's not such a monumental marker now I mean it's it's still a big deal for sure um, but uh, a couple guys have done 1080s the Tom Shar kid is it Tom Shar and uh, Mitchy Brusco so what's the limit on this like what what do you think the limit's going to be on how because the the Tom Tom Shar when he hit that Obviously, his ramp is in this. This it, it's he came with a much more speed right, right, coming yeah. down. So, is a, is a big part of how much more we continue with 1080, and then what's going to be after that is going to be a uh, 1260, and then whatever. Is it purely going to be a math the physics where how much the speed's going to be going into it? <laughs> I mean, is there a limit to it? I don't it? think I, I don't think that it's it's not just a matter of math. It's a matter of risk and skill and you know to spin past 1080 is going to require big height which is tenfold risk factor um and faster spinning and and um you know body dynamics and there's all kinds of issues with that but i think that um to answer your question yes the bigger ramps will can help because it gives you that more airtime. and people like to say like well that's cheating i'm telling you if you're facing a 30 foot ramp there's no cheating about that. A 30-foot ramp? Well, that's, I mean, the, the, the ramp that Tom Shard did a 1080 on is 28 feet tall. Twice, it's twice this. This is 13 and a half. This is 13 and a half, yeah. So when you're coming up a 28-foot wall, that means you have to go double the amount of speed that you're going on this thing. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's no cheating element to that oh, at all. Believe it's me, frightening it's, it's, and it's dangerous. I and, mean, look, we were just <clears> standing here and Sean fell one time. Sean White, he, he fell one time. And right. Mark's like, he, it sounds like you are like, you just broke your knee. Right. Right? So when you watch it from the outside and you see these falls, yeah. matter of fact, what's the worst injury you've had, uh, worst accident? You were showing me something right here and to you it was like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Oh, I almost hit uh, that pole. My worst accident was a broken pelvis. That happened when I was in my late 30s, and um, it actually taught me a lot about, about sort of my priorities and what I take for granted and, and how much I love skating, that I would push through such a traumatic injury to get back on my skateboard. You know, it, it's, not because, it's not because I want to get paid again. It was just more because I love skating, and it's such my identity at this point. And uh, I couldn't do without it, and, and um, it was really hard. It was like it was one of the hardest years of my life. Was reevaluating, you know, what I love doing, and sort of making compromises with it in terms of what I could do, and getting my confidence back. How how many times have you broken a bone? Like, if you have you counted, is there? Um, I I've been pretty like I do more minor more like sprains and ligament stuff like that, and I've had a couple knee surgeries. But actual broken bones was my pelvis, my elbow and uh, my rib. 
how do you come back from that? I mean, how do you come back from that when you have an injury like that? And you, you know, you're walking me, it's, it's like uh, uh, when Sugar Ray Leonard got uh, lost to uh, Nomas, and, and he talked about for three years, I just kind of wanted to be away from the limelight because I don't want to come back. How do you um, make that comeback? It wasn't, it, wasn't the, it wasn't about the limelight. It was just about me wanting to get back on my skateboard. And, and um, how did I come back? It took a while. You know, it, took, it took a while to, because suddenly the thing that I was doing when I got hurt was not something that was foreign to me or, or that was necessarily that hard. And so it made me question everything I took for granted at that point and tricks that I knew that I could do on any given day. And so I would be doing tricks thinking like, wait, am I, is this really safe? Am I capable of this? And you start to question everything. And it, it took me a, about a year to get not only my tricks back, but my sense of confidence back. It's kind of been hesitant a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and I should be, you know, <laughs> like the, you can't get hurt doing this. Yeah, no, the world you're in, you definitely can get hurt right. doing doing what you're doing. So how does, how does one, so for instance, everybody says, oh my gosh, you're Tony Hawk, oh my gosh, you're the greatest, oh my gosh, you're, you changed the game, you're the Michael Jordan. Back in the days, we used to compare you to Michael Jordan. You and I were talking about it earlier. I asked about Tiger Woods, uh -huh. you know, the Michael Jordan of skateboarding. You're hearing all this stuff. What are you telling yourself when someone's giving you the compliment for you to stay level-headed and not be too cocky to forget the basic fundamentals of crossing the line that it can hurt yourself? Are, what's your self-talk to yourself? Um, I just, I never really bought into the hype. I mean, I was excited that people recognized me and, and, and I was honored that they would compare me to someone of that stature. But I, I always felt like skateboarding as much as an art form as is a sport and it's apples to oranges when you're comparing skill levels. It's not like who can score the most or who's the fastest. It's way more about um, subjective style. And so I couldn't really take that to heart. You know what I mean? I never, I never got into skateboarding to be number one like that was such a jock mentality and that's what I was trying to rail against when I left <laughs> when I left basketball and baseball maybe that's why you did so well maybe that's why you took it to I hope so I mean I, and, and also I, I had enough experience with people who were full of themselves and people I looked up to that to know that like I'm I don't want to go down that path and you see the level of creativity with you now I mean you're, at this point for you, it's, it's just purely trying to test what else is possible. I saw you do a couple projects. One of them was, uh, what was that one thing that you did with Sony? You came spiral. up and then the spiral. Yeah, that was uh -huh. sick, by the way. I, oh, thank you. And then you did a loop, you know, and there's all these other things. And then you did the hoverboard stuff. What's, what's next? Like, what is the next innovative <laughs> thing that we're going to see with skateboard? Is, like, all those things were just sort of wild ideas that I mean, that's pretty I got, cool, though. I, I mean, watching, for, watching yeah. what you did with the loop, that was sick. Yeah, I mean, I, but also I always thought, like, well, we've done the loop. You know, why not just turn that sideways? And then we presented that to Sony, and they agreed to fund it. And that's kind of how it went. Um, I don't really have any... Big, uh, you know, I was working. I was working on this video of of documenting 50 tricks that I've created for so long that I just now have finished it. That I'm sort God, of so you just want to break. I'm trying to process that. Yeah, and, and I felt like there was some closure there. I mean, a lot of the tricks I did in that video, those that'll be the last time I do them for sure. So it, when did when did uh, uh, Tony Hawk uh, your your game come out? When did when did that game come uh, out? 1999. So the year you did yeah. 900. Yeah, yeah. How much long? How much afterwards did that? Uh, it was not long after that. Um, we had been working on it for almost two years prior to that. There's a misconception where people think like, I made 900, then I got a video game deal, then everything exploded. It was like, no, th those things were very much in the work. I had been working very hard on that video game for two years prior to that day. I mean, it, yes, there was a, there was definitely a perfect storm of timing. Yeah, you know, that's, everything. that's it. Absolutely. Um, and I felt very lucky in that. And, and mostly, the, I guess the funny thing is, is that that year of competition, I already kind of knew it was going to be my last because I wanted to free up my schedule to do other things. Um, and then doing 900 was sort of a, you know, a good out. It was the icing on the cake. But I'd never thought of that as being this big promotion for a video game. So it was purely. Uh, uh, yeah, I never, you know, I mean, I never, I, I never put those two things together. And the only thing that I remember uh, that come, well, the, I remember right after that, I called Neversoft, who was making the video, and because I knew we were in the last stages of it. I mean, it was about to be submitted to Sony to be approved. And I said, hey, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have time to do this, but you might want to throw a 900 in there as a special trick. After you did it or before? After I did it. After you did it. Yeah. Got it. 
but we were so close to the deadline there. I didn't know if they had time. And I remember, I remember getting an email back immediately, like we're already on it. <laughs> yeah, of they yeah have. like we watched it. It's happening. So we're doing what, that. June 27. When did a video game come out? It, uh, I want to say it was August or September. There's no way in the world they can make a game that quickly in two months, and that's something <laughs> yeah, they've no, been working no, no. on no. for years. Yeah. It's it's uh, to to be able to do something like that. So that led you, and 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 I know you were talking something about uh, the skateboarding earlier. You said there's not enough of these out there. So is that what inspired you to start your foundation, where you put up now? what, 556 different skateboarding, yeah. and you've raised $5.2 million, whatever the number is, a little over $5 million. Is that where the inspiration came from? Yeah, the, the inspiration, I mean, it, it came mostly from having been lucky enough to have a skate park near me when I was growing up, and it was one of only a handful across the country. So I, I, that was never lost on me, how lucky I was to have that, that space. Um, and had that community and and I mean it, it really it, it defined who I was as a skater and having this really Interesting collection of people that would be there at skating bouncing ideas off of each other. So when I had a chance to When I had a chance to maybe affect change however I could and and through skateboarding my go-to was to build skate parks and that came at a time when some parks were being built and they were being built by cities that were more affluent and we're not, um, we're not contacting the local skaters to have their involvement. So these, these cities would put up money, they would go to the lowest bidding sidewalk contractor and they would make a skate park that they thought was good, that was almost unskatable. And, and, and I saw that cycle happening time and time again because they just weren't, they weren't designed by skaters. This is pre you starting Before your foundation. Before the foundation. Got it. And so my, my incentive for starting the foundation in 2002 was to turn that tide of, of having these facilities be built, but to include the actual skaters in the process of the ones they're catering to, the one they're providing for, but also to direct that money to more needy areas because I felt like the kids in the areas are more influent, they, they did have other options. And a lot of these kids in, that felt more disenfranchised but chose skating had no support for it. And if anything, we're told not to do it because Got they, it. they thought it was had some negative connotation. So what places have you built them? What, what are some cities you put, you know, you can find? Oh, uh, well, we're up to 580 parks right now, but I mean, you know, in places like, as iconic as Compton and Long Beach and Watts and East St. Louis, um, Detroit. Oh, so you go into the real places where you're putting them up. You're not putting yeah. this up in you know, in suburbs and the upper class, you, you, you put them up in places. No, we, we wanted to go to the more low income uh, areas where, where kids choose to skate and have no support. And what have you seen since ever since you've been doing that? What's been what's been happening since uh, you've done that? We see, well, we, we try to empower the groups that have already got the ball rolling themselves. So we want to we want to help them, give them resources, give them endorsement, validation for their park. And that usually goes a long way. Um, and we give them money, too, of course. But what we found is that the, the sense of pride and the sense of empowerment that the kids get when they see a project through and they've actually run through all the red tape and they've gone to the city council meetings and they see it actually happen that they can affect change. There's a sense of, of self that comes with that that I feel like a lot of them would have never found otherwise. So, so what, what, what are you seeing right now happening mm -hmm. with th your industry? What's next with your world? What are you foreseeing taking place? What level of innovation is gonna come next as a whole industry? Um, I think, uh, well, skating is always innovative. It always continues to break new boundaries, you know, new tricks, new techniques, new styles. So I never worry about that because that's, that's been a common thread through my whole life. I think what I'm more interested in is the international growth of skateboarding and the places I've seen it grow that are very unlikely places that most people would not associate with skating. In like, for example, there's a strong skating scene in Ethiopia. There, is, there are two skate park projects that involve education in Cambodia. There's a skate park in a village in Uganda. These are Tony Hawk Foundation? or No, but some, some we have helped in terms of either uh, giving them resources or funding the group that is actually the one that did the park. Skatistan one is one in particular. The, their work is incredible. They have, they have a whole skate facility in Afghanistan, in Kabul, um, that thrives. That's amazing. That has... You know, they're always full. They have equal uh, ratio of boys to girls participating. 
Um, and so that kind of stuff is what excites me, seeing skateboarding grow in these places that I never imagined anyone would even yeah. see a skateboard. It's, it's kind of like what happened with the NBA when Yao Ming came in and how uh -huh. Kobe and the Dream Team in you know, China and how big they were seen and then Kobe became God to the people in China and then NBA became an international thing and obviously it went to a whole different uh, level. Now, the transition from you being a you know, skateboarder to somebody that goes and becomes an entrepreneur, how did that transition take place for you? Uh, well, I think it, it, it all stemmed from having the video game success because suddenly I found myself with all these different opportunities that were far beyond the scope of endemic skate <laughs> companies and it became more of, of more like corporate endorsements and, and suddenly I was in this world that, that had not been traveled uh, from a skateboarding perspective and then suddenly I, was like, I had to be incorporated and then I found myself looking at various business opportunities of things that I could actually create because it was like <clears throat> for example uh, my siblings and I, we all had young children at the time, and we could not find cool clothes for them. We just, you know, everything for kids in the early 90s was like dressing them up as little soldiers, or like Oshkosh Bagosh, like they were little dolls, and, it, and we wanted, you know, and the kids were kind of into to skateboarding and stuff. They wanted to look the part. And so we decided to, to start a clothing company based on skate culture for kids, Hawk Clothing. It was, it was things like that. It was, like that. it was how I became an entrepreneur, was, was through those sort of avenues. And then with this ramp, this ramp was the catalyst for starting a whole arena tour, Boom Boom Huck Jam. Talk about that. Talk about uh, you know, what, what this led into. Because I know you got, a, you got another thing that you also, what's the other business that you have going on right now? I'm not talking to one. You invested into a, uh, what's it called? Blue Coffee Bottle, oh, Blue, Blue Bottle, Bottle Coffee. Coffee. Yeah that I think Nestle bought 68% yeah. of it for like yeah. 500 million. Yeah. And you were one of the investors uh -huh. into that. So yeah. what, what, what else, you um, know, what well, else? Well, things like that, I, you know, I, I think I'm, <clears throat> through, my, through my experience as an entrepreneur doing these other projects, suddenly I found myself with other opportunities just through connections. And that, be, that was just through a friend in San Francisco um, who, who found out I was a fan of Blue Bottle. And because I, I mentioned it to him one time and he said, hey, you know, I'm actually part of a group that's going to buy Blue Bottle. And so I got in at the early stages of that. And then, you know, when Nestle came in, I got cashed out and it was amazing. But um, it, it's more things like that where if it sounds interesting and, I, and you know, I'm, I've, I'm one that is prone to take risks through my life, through skating, and, and so I do the same with, with doing business stuff. Is there, a, is there a process you go through on who you invest in? Do you have like certain? It's just more if it's intuition, if it feels right, if it's something I'm excited about, then I'm, then I'm in. Got it, very cool. So uh, uh, last but not least, what is the name of the business you currently run? There was another business that uh, uh, I think your partner was telling me about that started off purely accidental with the skateboards, and then now it's- uh, Birdhouse? Yes, Birdhouse. So Birdhouse is my skate company. That was the first company I started, um, 1992. It's, it's been my passion project ever since. You know, we, we've definitely gone through ups and downs of, of sales. We've uh, gone through many incarnations of team, but I feel like now we're in a sweet spot in, in terms of we have one of the best teams around. Um, we have a streamlined business. You know, we, we do it more like uh, licensing and, um, and I'm still proud. I mean. It, 25, we're, we're at 26 years now as a skate company, that's pretty unheard of. Most skate companies have their sort of flavor of the month or you know they have a good run for a few years and then they're gone. So it's still fun and, and, and it keeps me grounded because the, the guys on the team, they're awesome. They are, they are entrenched in skateboarding in the most hardcore way and, uh, and I love spending time with them. <laughs> that's cool. So who, who, are, who are some of the current Tony Hawks you see? Who's like the next Tony Hawk? Some of the younger guys coming up. Are there anybody you have your eyes on when you say this guy's gonna be special? Um, well, I, I guess with the Olympics coming up, uh, you know, there, people are wanting to know the sort of favorites there. I can tell you there's this pool skater um, from Australia, Keegan Palmer, who won the last event there and he's at least five years younger than everyone else. And he is going to be a force to be reckoned with at the, at the bowl event for sure. How old is he right now? That is a good question. I want to say 15, maybe. I, that is yeah. So 
I remember the first time I got on a skateboard in Iran. I was six years old. I fell so hard on my back. <laughs> I said, this ain't for me. That's I put usually, the skateboard aside. And that's I usually the, the, the line in the sand for people. It's the first time they get heard like, that. Ah, that's it. No, no, that's yeah. it. I'm good. You know, I, I was at, uh, 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 what is uh, that one place in uh, Denver? Uh, not Aspen, not um, Vail. Boulder. It's, uh, not with, it's with a B as well. What's the... Uh, uh, Crest uh, Butte. Uh, no, there's, it's a real, Mark, what was the name of the place I was at? In, in, Jennifer loves this place. Anyways, we're over there and I'm trying to snowboard, right, snowboard. And it's just, you know, no matter how many times, you know, when I fall and, and uh, I, I, still like the, I still like the part of it, but it's not something that uh, I can pick up. So for me, I always respected guys who were skaters oh. because you were kind of like, man, you're doing something, there's no way in the world I could do it myself. <laughs> Um, but it, it's, it's great to see guys like you. And I think one of the things when I watch it from an outside as a fan and I see you and I see Sean and then you watch both of you just talking to Sean, the way he was talking, like, you know, it's no big deal. It is amazing the love of the game the two of you have for what you do. It is amazing to see a guy like you, a guy like Tiger, a guy like Jordan, a guy like Kobe. That love of the game is so common for the people that make it to the highest level where it's more than just the money part, where it's more than just the fame part, where it's more than it. Because once that comes, what do you do next? Uh, well, it's mostly, if that's your motivation and you get a taste of it, then you lose, you lose the incentive to, to keep going or to get better. And that was never my motivation. So to this day, you know, I do something that I get paid ridiculous amounts of money that I would do for free. Till this day? Yeah, any time. That's cool, that's cool. Well, listen, what's your handle, by the way, on Twitter? Is it just Tony, Tony Hawk? Hawk. Tony Hawk, look. If you watch this interview and you're a skater yourself or somebody that's watched this stuff and you've played this game or whatever it is, send him a tweet and let him know what you got <laughs> out of today's interview. Yes, please. Yeah, send him a tweet and let him know what you got out of the interview. And by the way, May 12th, if you watch this before or after when it comes out, go watch the video. What's the title of that video going to be, by the way? Oh, that's a good question. Do I have to make it up right now? So, so. Uh, it should be 50 at 50. 50 at 50, Tony Hawk. I can't wait to see it on May 12th. Brother, thank All you right, so much for your you. time. Truly. Yeah.